What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, and I'm director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. On this series, Speaking Freely, we talk from time to time with thought leaders and major players in the free speech drama unfolding in America. Today, Zach Wood. He's made a name for himself as a student at Williams College in Massachusetts, where he led Uncomfortable Learning, a group that invites speakers with extreme views to campus. Zach Wood, uh, you go to Williams College, yes. uh, and uh, it's a very outstanding liberal arts college in rural Massachusetts, and you have made a name for yourself by saying that not all views are welcome there. I wonder if you could explain that to us briefly. Definitely. So, I, you know, I started uh, working with Uncomfortable Learning uh, as a sophomore. Now, and uncomfortable learning, what is that exactly? So, Did you start the club? So I didn't start the club. I started out uh, working with the club as just a member and then worked my way through and eventually became president of the club. It's essentially a student group on campus that brings controversial speakers in hope of sparking difficult conversations around issues that are generally tough for people to broach. And uh, through uncomfortable learning, you came to believe that the spectrum of debate at Williams was narrow? You know, the thing is, I've always enjoyed debating, and I've always enjoyed politics and is social issues, political issues, economic issues. And so it was sort of natural for me to gravitate uh, to uncomfortable learning events. And Randall Kennedy spoke on my campus uh, during my freshman year. And so that really sparked my interest in the group specifically. And then the president uh, then asked me to join. And since then, I've been on board Remind us who Randall Kennedy is. So Randall Kennedy is a Harvard Law professor who's written a lot about race, uh, known for a book called Race, Crime, and the Law, and he's also uh, spoken on some points with respect to the First Amendment as well. And you have had a situation where you contend that sp certain speakers, <clears throat> you've had a situation where you contend that certain speakers are not welcome at Williams. And in fact, the invitations have been canceled. Yes, so there, there are two incidents. One was with a speaker named Suzanne Vanker. She was an anti-feminist. Uh, one of her main arguments was that feminism in its current incarnation, intersectional feminism that is, is a war against men. And uh, me and my colleagues, members of Uncomfortable Learning, on the board at the time, thought that that was a perspective that we needed to contend with, a perspective that was deserving of you know, trenchant criticism. But the student body didn't feel the same way. There were a number of students on campus, uh, many student activists in particular, a number of minorities on campus, the feminist collective, who were fiercely against the idea of bringing Vanker to campus. So once I announced the event on Facebook, essentially what happened is, I'd say within about, some comments appeared within seconds, uh, various te <laughs> text messages and so forth appeared within minutes, and you just get comment after comment after comment, and none of these are Zach, we disagree with you because of X or Y. It's all, I can't believe you're a filthy, sexist pig, and you know, very incendiary, inflammatory statements. Mm -hmm. And I understood the backlash, but that was the first time. So it was a, it was a bit jarring. So uh, you canceled moment. her invitation. We, so, right, so Uncomfortable Learning ended up canceling it because my two, I, I actually didn't want to cancel it at the time, but it was majority rules. So you had three students on the board, and my colleagues were really concerned about the event being destructive and not being a productive event, someone throwing something at the speaker, it devolving into something that really no one wants to see. So because of that, we decided to disinvite. But there was a second disinvitation uh, later on that year with John Derbyshire, who was a writer at National Review. 
Former writer at National Review. Former writer at National Review. National Review dismissed him for his, his uh, what they said were racist the views. The talk, yeah, he had a, a talk that he wrote for a Taki magazine, I believe, and it was basically a non-black version of the talk that many uh, minority parents really have to give to their children. Right, and and uh, a number of incendiary claims. The the uh, well, not uh, some people said that in in his proposed talk there were quite a few racist remarks. There were a number, yes. What would have been the value of having him speak at Williams? So, you know, in my view, it was that you know, he was a strong Trump supporter. He shared Trump's view on immigration. He had a number of views that uh, we could say, you know, really aligned with Trump's base. Do you think he shared Trump's views on race? I think he did share Trump's views on race, and I think he shared views that a lot of Trump's base shares on race. And because of that, because a significant segment of the American population uh, believes these things, you know, I thought that as Williams College students who are going to go into many spheres to make a difference, it'd be important for us to learn how to articulate our disagreements, to get a better sense of what experiences, what evidence or lack thereof informs that viewpoint. But, but some of the students apparently said that they felt they would be endangered by Derbyshire being there, that they felt that his views were so extreme and so hostile to African Americans that it would it would actually be a dangerous situation. They say it, it was denigrating. This was you know it was denigrating. It'd be dehumanizing. Um, it's saying that you know African Americans shouldn't exist on this campus. Those were the arguments I was getting. And in response to that, I'd say you know it's very clear to me how a number of the things that he says are hurtful. It's very clear to me how a number of the things he says as an African American, as a minority on, uh, at an elite institution, it's clear to me how this is going to be difficult for many people, myself included. But I think that it's important as a part of our education to have a space in which we can engage deliberatively with uncomfortable ideas, with ideas that are really going to push us outside of our comfort zone and force us to confront things that are less familiar and things that are ultimately in some ways very offensive. Is, is there a line anywhere that gets crossed by some people? I mean, I, certainly the, the uh, principles you're asserting are very reasonable. Right, sure. One has to confront sure. uh, I different ideas, hostile ideas, uh, uh, has to realize some of these things are out there. But is there a line that gets crossed by some people? that goes too far. So f for me personally, I make a distinction between where I draw a line and where I see criteria, you know, the criteria that I use in choosing speakers. Where I draw the line is if a speaker is making a threat or deliberately trying to incite, you know, I draw the line where the first amendment is drawn. However, that does not mean that Viol I'm uh, most inciting violence imminent now right. say if, if speech incites violence, Imminently, then it's, right, exactly. Yeah. And do you think Derbyshire might have incited violence at Williams? No, I think that, I think that you could categorize uh, a good portion of what he says as hurtful, even hateful, as extremely offensive, but I, I, don't, I don't think uh, that it, it posed an imminent threat in the way that uh, someone who's saying, you know, we should harm people or hurt people would. Well, well, whom would you not invite? for example, who, who's on the other side of that line? Would you invite the head of ISIS to speak at Williams? Would I invite that? No, no, that's a terror, no. That's a terrorist, there, under no circumstances would I invite that individual to speak at Williams. Would you invite Louis Farrakhan to speak at Williams? Sure, but here's the thing though. When I, when I say sure I would, it's that I wouldn't object to it on principle. The criteria though is important in that when I'm inviting a speaker, I have to think that the issue is socially relevant, race, sexism, gender issues, class, environmental issues, those are things that are in the newspapers every day, that are in the media every day, that we as a society are really focusing on and discussing often. And for that reason, I would invite speakers to speak on those issues. But I'll give you an example, Holocaust denial. With that issue in particular, that's not something, I mean, you have a few people who call themselves scholars, in my opinion, who are mm. arguing that the Holocaust didn't take place or didn't take place mm. in the degree, right? the degree to which history proves it did. I'm not going to invite a Holocaust denier to campus, not because I don't think they have a right to speak, but simply because I don't think that there's much intellectual value in engaging with a perspective that has been proven time and time again. And is there intellectual value in Louis Farrakhan's denunciation of Judaism as a gutter religion, and, and would that not offend students in the same way that a Holocaust denier That's would? That's a great question. I, th you know, I think it really would offend students, but I think there are other things that Louis Farrakhan says that could be worth engaging with. 
his views on where the African American community stands economically in the United States. And you know, I disagree with a considerable portion of what Louis Farrakhan thinks and, and says, um, but I do think that there are some things that could be worth engaging with uh, discursively there, mm -hmm. whereas with a, a neo-Nazi or a Holocaust denier, I just I don't see it. You told the Senate Judiciary Committee when you had the great opportunity to testify, and right. I think that, right, yeah, that yeah. drew a lot of attention to right. you. Uh, you told them you'd never heard it, never knew of a conservative speaker being at Williams during your entire time there. But there's some people who say there have been conservative speakers at Williams. At least Stefanik, I believe she's a congresswoman from upstate right. New York. Uh, well, Chris Gibson, a former Republican congressman who spoke there. So what I would, uh, I would, you know, I would ramify that point, and I would say that I don't, I haven't seen any efforts on the part of the administration to bring concern. There are faculty members who have made an effort to have panels and have discussions that are left, right, or point, counterpoint based. Right. David Brooks did speak in 2012 or 2013, I believe, but I wasn't on campus then. Right. And so the two speakers you're referring to, those are exceptions, but from my understanding, those efforts were faculty led. And so my point there was that. Well, but the point is, you, you said you, you there hadn't I didn't, been I didn't, any conservative speakers. Yeah, I didn't speakers. know of any conservative speakers who had spoken yeah. at Williams. So those in my are just time there. people you you weren't aware of. I was not aware that they came. I actually think yeah. one of them might have taken place while I was away. For well, that a year, that's actually. certainly possible. So yeah. Right. So, but um, but still, they 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 did speak at Williams and they did, yeah. And I, I uh, the I'd distinction of whether they were invited by a student group or a faculty group or an administrative an administrator is that is that an important distinction? I think it's something to note. Right, I think that it's not that faculty shouldn't invite them or students should. No, it's it's true. just that I think that if you look at the speakers who are invited by the administration, you will notice that they tend to fall on the left. And I myself identify as a liberal. I identify as a Democrat, and I agree with a number of the speakers that Williams invites and brings to campus. But in discussing these issues and how divisive they are, and the ways in which they sometimes become come adversarial. I think it's important to notice trends and to observe ways in which right. students are not being given as many opportunities to engage with multiple perspectives. Right. The reason why I think the point is important is because in my experience as a student, in many classes, what you're hearing is the liberal views of your professors. And I'm not saying professors shouldn't express their views. I'm just saying that if we're trying to get to, if we're trying to have robust and open discussion, we've also got to have uh, conservatives present right. too. Well, I, I, I certainly understand your point. I'm, right. I'm a former president of a liberal arts college right. myself at Goucher, Goucher College right. in, in Baltimore, and I tried very hard to make yeah. sure we had speakers of different points of view. But I, I think the um, what I perceive or understand from what you're saying that un uncomfortable learning was trying to do was to bring people um, on an extreme of the spectrum. Now, that, that doesn't mean they don't have a right to be heard, but what's your definition of conservative, conservative There's, speakers? So I'd say just a slight amendment on uncomfortable learning. Sure. We have brought a range. We've brought Reginald Dwayne Betts. Randall Kennedy is on the left. He just happens to have a few controversial views, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so the point of uncomfortable learning is to head on, you know, to take on issues that are not just difficult, not just held by conservatives, but the ones that really push us outside of the, the bounds of what we're initially more comfortable with. And so when I define conservative, it does tend to be people who are on the more extreme ends of the spectrum. Well, so that lead, brings me to the question, if you're concerned about students being exposed to conservative views, sure. why not invite some people? Uh, who are more? Well, who uh, Jeff Flake, the senator from Arizona, well, uh, Ben Sass from Nebraska. There are, right. there are Republican conservative oh, senators who have things to say and don't, at least on the evidence so far, don't seem to provoke these huge showdowns. Absolutely. So two points on that, I would say. Uh, one is we brought David French uh, recently. and uh, Tell me who he David is. French is a senior writer at the National Review. Mm -hmm. He's also a veteran. Uh, he was a contributor to a book called The Rise of ISIS, and he mm -hmm. spoke about American foreign right. policy. And I'd say he's conservative, but he's not an extremist. In so any, he was in accepted, respect. and he spoke. He was accepted. He spoke. The conversation was, I thought, very productive. 
uh, very important and a good precedent to set. Uh, I would also say that you know we. Like so I said, there, the line is drawing itself for you. Who's a, <laughs> who's on which side of the line? He, he he was. Did he get a good audience? He got it. He got a. It was a relatively small audience in comparison to other talks that we've had, but that was mainly because midterms uh, right. were going on that week. But nobody was throwing things. Nobody was feeling threatened and screaming and right. And, and, and right. Were, nobody was. Yeah. Nobody. There were no was severe reactions. Not at all. Not. It was very. It was a very positive discussion. So what's the I lesson in, in that as compared to the reaction of inviting Derbyshire, for example? Well, I, I would say the lesson is that you know, you realize that there are certain settings, certain spaces, certain dynamics that in which people feel more comfortable engaging with issues. But I do not think that that's a reason uh, in and of itself for us not to invite speakers with extreme views. It's not as if we have only, Uncomfortable Learning has only invited speakers with extreme views. It's that the two speakers who have gotten the most attention, you know, on which the media has focused the most, have been speakers with the most extreme views. Right. Right. So it's not just that every speaker Uncomfortable Learning brings is the most extreme. The speakers who have been less extreme, they just don't get as much attention from the student body, as much attention from the administration, as much pushback. But and that's, you know, I mean, that intuitively So makes that's sense. a good thing. In a way, you know, I don't. You know, I'm glad we could have the positive conversation, but I wish we could do the same thing with more difficult views. And I would point to Charles Murray coming to campus as an example. Of, Did he come to? He Williams? came to Williams. There were at least 200 people present at the talk, and we got a we had a great Q and A, great pushback. He was challenged. He had to clarify things. And so he was bit. welcomed at Williams in a sense. Uh, there were a lot of people who thought he shouldn't be there. Well, but when he showed up people came prepared to engage. Right. And so, you know, so, that. So I would think that's a good model. That is a good model. I agree. I think that's a good model. Um, and I think that that stands to show that we shouldn't just, I don't think that we should just try to bring people who are conservatives and moderates, but that I think we should try to bring a range. And the point is, unfamiliar views, views that are challenging. And so, I mean, we're going to have an event also on mass incarceration. And the two speakers we're bringing are on the left. They just happen to be critical of this idea of the new Jim Crow. And so that is a view that's very popular on campus. There are a lot of people who buy into that argument. So that's one perspective that we're bringing that happens to be on the left and even progressive to an extent. And you expect to have pushback on bringing those people to campus? Not as much, no, because of their bent. The only other point I would make with respect to the senators that you mentioned, I don't believe that we're allowed to bring sitting, sitting uh, political figures. And why would that be? It's just a rule. I'm actually not sure. It seems fairly arbitrary to me, mm -hmm. but I know that there were students who were interested in bringing Bernie Sanders, and they, they couldn't do that because he was running. It was seen as a partisan it. event. It's seen as something. a partisan event, exactly. Yeah. So if it's a former governor or a former congressman, mm -hmm. that is a possibility. It's something I've But there are a lot of conservative thinkers out there, as you've of just course. shown oh, with, yeah. with this guy, David French. French, right. Uh, and, and it's feasible to have conservative thinkers there and absolutely. not have a huge job. By, by the way, what, why did things go well or well enough with Charles Murray at Williams but not at Middlebury College? When, when he went to Middlebury College there was really a major uproar that attracted national and international right. attention. What I, was the difference? I don't want to presume to know too much because I wasn't at Middlebury. Of course, nor was but, I. Right. But I, I think that perhaps part of it may have been the framing of the respective mm -hmm. events mm -hmm. and it also may have been I've written a number of things about the work that I'm doing, and I've defended my position vigorously at times. And in, you have. I, and, and, and in doing so, I've really made an effort to mm -hmm. engage with many students individually, to have conversations with them. And while a number still won't agree with me, or still may not be on my side, I think they come to understand that I'm, I, I take this issue seriously, I really care about it, and that the reasons for which I'm engaged are ultimately based on on principles. So ex explain how you framed Murray. Was he under your auspices? Yes. Yep. And how you framed him at Williams so that it succeeded? So, so the way in which I framed it was this is an opportunity for us to engage with a scholar who has not only received critical acclaim. Uh, this is someone who uh, has views, libertarian views, that uh, I think we need to understand if we're going to look at issues of inequality in America, mm -hmm. whether you're going to the bell curve or coming apart. And there's this, this sort of big discussion that is that has continued, it's been going on for a while now, about how you explain disparities and achievement gaps. And Murray's 
you know, a lot of what he says in the bell curve has played a role in that. And even though there have been a number of counterpoints, uh, a number of scholars, a number of scientists who have pushed back and disproved and debunked, he's still speaking often. There is still, I think, a number of Americans who would believe in a good bit of what he's saying, whether you point to his arguments on welfare or even the points on the studies he did mm -hmm. on intelligence. And I think it's something for us to contend with. So that was the way I framed it. This is not an opportunity for you to be persuaded by Charles Murray. <clears throat> That's not how I. But an opportunity to engage his ideas. To engage his ideas, to understand what's the evidence it's based on, what experiences inform it. Why is he pushing for what he's pushing for? One thing that I've come to realize is that there are very few people you talk to who will say they are not for a more just world. <laughs> it's important to understand sure. what they mean when they say they're for a more just world. Right. So we're bringing Charles Murray because we want to understand what's he pushing for, what changes does he, does he want to make, and what principles are they based on. Well, Chris Williams has some of the best students in the country. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's celebrated as one of the very top liberal right, arts yeah. colleges. So I would think that you would have an audience there that would be one that a lot of serious conservative thinkers or liberal thinkers or, or anyone would want to engage with, would want to have the opportunity to, to talk to. So it should be an attractive place. For, it, it it's a little hard to get there. But. It, it should be. I'd, I'd point out, and I, you know, I think you're right, you know, at least in theory. One trend, and this is something a lot of people talk about how social media plays into these fallouts, plays into disinvitations, plays into the, the backlash that I've received, for instance. But one thing that I think is left out of the equation or out of the discussion is the idea that for those who identify as progressives on college campuses, not just liberals, but progressives, one goal, one endpoint, uh, is to achieve greater inclusion. And what that has come to mean is not just that you want to increase the presence of minorities on campus, but that you want everyone to feel welcome and comfortable. Well, that's not to a feel, bad thing. That not is a not a thing. bad thing at all. I support it. Right. The issue is, the reason why I, I sort of note this, is because if you want everyone to feel welcome, people will say that they feel less welcome if you bring David French, and especially if you bring Christina Hoff Summers, or Charles Murray, or John Derbyshire. That's why, in part, I think this issue has uh, risen in the way that it has you in know, the past few years. President Trump has said that he actually doesn't think this is a problem. He thinks that wherever he goes on college campuses that conservative views are very welcome. He thinks it's, it's been blown out of proportion. I don't think he knows what he's talking about. I, I, uh, I, I really disagree with that. You know, I'd, I would never purport to be able to speak to what's going on on every college campus. Well, of course there, are, you know, there are a number of databases. Sure. FIRE does a good job, the Foundation for Indi Individual Rights and in Education. Um, there are a number of organizations that are, that are watching this very closely, but I, I don't think that's an accurate representation of what's going on. I don't think it's as simple a case uh, as just free speech is being threatened and it's because students don't want to engage with conservatism. I think that that's... Well, there are places where actually uh, liberal voices, progressive voices have been silenced as well. Absolutely, yes. And so I think the conversation is more complicated than that, it's more nuanced than that. And so when we get into discussions of hypersensitivity and intolerance, I think it's really important for us to understand that a number of the students who, who have a problem with what I'm doing have a problem with it because they think certain issues, certain topics have already been conclusively decided upon. There's no need to discuss this anymore. Right, so that's that's part of the, that's mm -hmm. part of what I'm contending with. But but the ultimate goal, it seems to me, and I don't know if it's easier or harder on small college campuses. It may be harder. Uh, should be to uh, indulge free speech, welcome free speech, but at the same time have people feel included to to promote free speech and inclusion at the same time. They're not necessarily opposed to each other, are they? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think they have to be. You know, I think it's, it is hard when you are bringing someone to campus and based on someone's personal experience, whether that's on a minority at an elite, predominantly white institution, whether it's based on a personal, a more traumatic personal experience that they've had before arriving on a college campus, it is very difficult for them to see that as an educational or edifying or, you know, event. 
And so that, I mean, I think it's... So it's the framing, it's the preparation it's, for the speaker, right? It's the framing, right? it's the preparation, it's the, it's, it, right, it's framing, it's how you describe what you're doing and showing that you do understand why this is difficult. Just calling, you know, my generation, calling millennials or calling students on college campuses today hypersensitive and intolerant and snowflakes gets us nowhere. So you don't use that vocabulary? I've used the word hypersensitive before, but I try to avoid but it But not snowflakes? Not snowflakes. I don't think I've ever used that, no. But even the, the phrase coddled, right. I understand what it's pointing to. And President, uh, former President Obama made a statement about that, and it was, you know, it went viral about he doesn't think students should be coddled. And I, and I totally agree. But I think that just in terms of the framing itself and the rhetoric itself, right. coddled, intolerant, hypersensitive, it makes people defensive in a way that is unnecessary. One more question. There's going to be a new president at Williams. She has been selected and yes. accepted the job. I don't know if she's appeared publicly on not campus yet, yet no. or not. But is this an opportunity for a fresh start at Williams? Is, it, is Williams an example where the dialogue can be improved by a new player at the top? I think it can. I'd like to be, you know, I'm optimistic about it, but uh, sensibly, reasonably so. You know, I think that college presidents are under a lot of pressure, and I, I disagree with Adam Fox's decision to disinvite Derbyshire. I've said that a number of times. I also disagree with the way in which he handled the, the public statements that were made afterwards. I don't think you know, as the college president, he demonstrated an understanding of the nuances of what was really going on, I don't think, personally. I think it's an opportunity for the administration to make progress. I don't think it's going to be swift. I don't think it's going to be fast. I think it'll be, like change often is, incremental. But it seems to me that it will be easier to make change if the people invited, the unconventional speakers invited, are less extreme let's say. I mean, would you invite Richard Spencer to speak at Williams? I'd invite Ben Shapiro before I'd invite Richard Spencer. Here's the thing about Richard Spencer. You've got to understand what you're getting into. I still would push back a little bit and say, you know, the point is to engage with uncomfortable views. I think we should have all manner of those. Well, but right? Richard Spencer so, says this should be a white country that everybody else sure, has sure. to step aside. Right. And uh, you know, I personally would like to sit down with Richard Spencer and, and talk to him. Now, would I invite him to Williams? You know, I don't know that he would I, be willing to talk to you because you don't have a place in his America. Well, he sat down and he talked to Charles Barkley. So I think I think he'd talk to me. I don't know if he'd, you know, how the conversation would go, but I'd I'd be interested in doing it. Would I bring him to Williams? I'd put it this way. If 15 students came to me and said, Richard Spencer is who we want to engage with, I'd invite him. But before doing that, I'd say, what about Ben Shapiro? And why is he a more appealing speaker? I've seen him go back and forth with people who are really trying to throw him off. I think he, he is an articulate spokesperson for the beliefs that he holds. I think that... But some people say he is racist about, toward Muslims. No, and you know, I, uh, I think that a number of things that he said about Muslims um, reflect, uh, uh, in, in some respect, what I would call racist beliefs. But I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know him, and I haven't had an opportunity well, to engage either, with him. So, I, so I, but I wouldn't say he is a racist before doing a little bit more of my homework right. on that. But I didn't say he was a racist. Of course, no, I know. Some people of course, right. feel uh, his expressed racist views. I don't think that's, that's a reason not to bring him. That's my main point. I don't think that's a reason not to bring him. I think that, you know, if, if it's the, the idea is to bring more David French's, it's that, you know, I can only bring five speakers in a year. I try to mix it up. But we get stuck on the, the and, and, and poor, it's important, but we get stuck on the most extreme examples, and there are a range of examples. When Randall Kennedy came, that was extremely productive. When John Christie, who was a climate skeptic, not denier, came, that was also productive. When Casey Johnson came and spoke about sexual assault, uh, sexual assault that was a very productive event. And so these are examples of speakers who are not So maybe the as other extreme. ones you should be basing your reputation on, not the ones who... Well, you know, it, it's that, so again, it's that I think we need both and. 
right? It's that we should have the Casey Johnsons and the David Frenches, and I'm bringing Jason Riley soon. But I think also to have, you know, John Derbyshire come once, I think it could be good. I think for, for students, it's about having that space and that opportunity for students who want to engage in it. What does the average Trump supporter, his base, those, those, uh, those in the American electorate who support him no matter what he says, why? How do we, you're not going to find many people like that at Williams. And if there are people like that at Williams who think that, in my experience, they don't feel comfortable saying it. That's why I think having a speaker on campus for two and a half hours, one, one time, could be very important. Well, of course, it's always a shame when people don't feel comfortable expressing their views on a college campus. That, that, that is something that no place should be proud of. Of course. And I've seen a lot of that. Right. Zach, thank you very much. Good luck with your book. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure to talk to you. We've been discussing the invitation of inflammatory speakers to college campuses with Zach Wood. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, visit our website, freespeechproject.georgetown.edu. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.